How can the small team behind No Man's Sky generate an entire universe? Even calling No Man's Sky huge is a colossal understatement. The biggest game world, such as Elder Scrolls II, would be but tiny specks on just one of its 18 quintillion globes. That number is so astronomically large that it's hard to even really comprehend. It would take 500 billion years to just dip your toe into every planet for just one second. So if you're a completionist, this is not the game for you. No Man's Sky will swallow you whole. In fact, even the people making it at Hello Games have only seen a very, very small slice. And yet the game world is somehow bustling with life. The beaches, mountain peaks, and desert lands are all diverse and contain incredible detail. Each biome is home to a huge variety of plant and animal species. So the question works exploring for today's show is how No Man's Sky's huge universe is inhabited with all of this life when it's created by a super small team with just four artists? The answer is actually pretty simple if you're Neil deGrasse Tyson. They simulate its science fictional worlds with math, but obviously this needs to be unpacked a little bit. As we learned in this fascinating New Yorker profile, the entire universe in No Man's Sky is created with mathematical formulas. This includes the plants and animals, the mountain ranges and crevasses in the landscape, the planet's atmosphere, the revolution of the stars through space, the whole of creation itself? Wait a second, what does it even mean for a game to be made with a formula? Now, we don't know the exact formulas that No Man's Sky is using, but we do know how they work. You may be thinking this is insanely complicated and maybe impossible, but to illustrate what I mean, we can just start with the easiest formulas to understand, which are the ones for plants, because they're plants. If you look at a common house plant, say the Scheffler, my personal favorite, you'll notice that each one follows a basic pattern, sometimes called a recursive pattern. The stem shoots off at regular intervals at about the same length and the leaves fan out in a similar shape each time. This holds true for trees and plants inside the game as well. These patterns of plants in real life can be replicated in the game in a simulation through what's known as an L system. L systems were developed by the Hungarian biologist Aristid Lindenmeyer, who was studying the growth patterns of plankton and algae. He discovered in 1968 that there was a very basic formula to how they grew. Here's how it works. It starts with A. A branches into A and B, and then B spawns another A. Eventually, these simple rules grow into a fairly elaborate model that looks like algae. According to Heim Gingold, the designer of Spore's creature creator, formulas like these can be thought of as virtual DNA that guides how a plant grows from a seed into maturity, which is cool, but how do No Man's Sky's developers get so many different types of plants? Well, just as humans and chimps have nearly the exact same DNA, slight changes to these formulas can produce drastically different results, and this gives rise to the incredible variety of plants on display in the game. As No Man's Sky's lead creator Sean Murray has said, one simple equation can define a limitless contour of hills and valleys. If you'd like to dive deeper into this, check out our episode on how Minecraft creates huge worlds with procedural generation. It's pretty amazing, if I might say so myself. So miraculously, this all makes sense for plants. But what about all those other varieties of dinosaurs and prehistoric fish? Where do they come from? One must remember that 18 quintillion planets takes a giant array of creatures to populate. And these creatures have complex needs, like plausible skeletal structures with bones that line up correctly so they can you know, move around. And the game requires thousands upon thousands of them. How does No Man's Sky account for that? Though much more complicated than algae, creatures are created in a similar way through mathematical formulas. It gets pretty in depth. Not even Grant Duncan knows exactly what's going on and he's the head artist on the game. But I still didn't really understand procedural generation. They must have tried to explain it to me hundreds of times. But at this talk on creating procedural art, he gave us the general idea. First, the artist uses an editor to come up with a template for a basic type of animal. Behind the scenes, the system is translating this information into a formula, like the simple plant formula we talked about, only way more advanced. Next, the creature goes inside a box of math called the blueprint system. This is where the magic happens. It's kind of like a cat carrier, except when your cat comes out, it's a bunch of different cats, which is great because you can never really have enough cats, if we're being honest. Bones are shortened and stretched out. It's given a new coat with different color fur, depending on its habitat. The body mass is reshaped. There's there's also tons of parts and appendages lying around, like shells, hooves, ears, and tentacles that could be snapped on and off by chance. At the end of the process, a whole Congo line of creatures marches out, all related to the original template that went in. Multiply this process about, you know, like a billion times, and before long, the game's universe is populated.
associated with a thriving animal kingdom. But it's more than plants and animals. It's star systems and bodies of water and land masses too. The entire canvas of No Man's Sky is governed by formulas like this, where the effects of one tiny change can ripple throughout the entire universe. And that's fascinating because these formulas bring games in concert with sciences like geology. But because games are fictional, they can even recreate alternate versions of the world that don't even exist. But of course, the process isn't foolproof. Using mathematical formulas to make games can lead to all kinds of goof-ups that must be sorted out. Like, I don't know, dinosaur dogs. The game is so expansive that the process of quality control is hard to do and has to be automated. For the task, the programmers have created some really cool tools. The team has AI art drones, for instance, that travel to millions of distant planets and record animated GIFs. They send these recordings to the artists who, at a glance, can see if their choices are aesthetically pleasing on the other side of the universe. Also, the AI knows color theory, so they can color coordinate red planets with a sufficiently ruddy environment. And of course, formulas can plant similar trees together and group animals and landscapes and biomes that are believable. So fingers crossed, when No Man's Sky is released, it's not only endlessly big, but also endlessly diverse and intricate, giving us something new to see every time we play and also has dinosaur dogs. So what do you think? Should these kinds of simulation techniques be used to create more games? Hash down in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. A special thanks goes out to Haim Gingold, who was kind enough to talk us through all the details of how you use formulas to create new life. You should totally check out his app, Earth Primer, which uses computational simulation to show how geology works. I'll link to it in the description. I'll see you next week. Last week we talked about games that are culturally insensitive. Let's see what you had to say. First of all, many, many, many of you, and by that I mean like half of you in the comments, including Albino Tanuki, made the case that having Callie and Smite was acceptable because her character model was designed after how she's actually depicted in Hinduism. That may be the case, but it kind of misses the point. My argument was not whether or not it was a realistic depiction of the god Kali. My argument was specifically about whether or not it's appropriate to put Kali in a game in which you're fighting other gods in the first place, simply because, you know, this game comes out of a Western tradition, specifically an American one. And so um, to sort of suggest that Kali is as foreign or as mythological as the god Zeus, I think is really what the problem is, especially when you have a billion people um, who still very actively worship the god Kali. So I'm questioning whether or not this is something that we should really even be doing in the first place. On a related note, Lunchbox says that the Virgin Mary might be a really cool character, but it would still be offensive to some Catholics because she's, well, sacred, and that means something to people. Um, the big difference, though, um, between an American studio depicting Callie and the Virgin Mary is that an American studio would be at least familiar with the context of Catholicism in the culture that they live in because that's something that they share. It would be very similar to, I don't know, an Indian studio picking the goddess Callie because that's very close to the culture that they would sort of be around, which is basically the point of the episode. My sense is, is that Callie gets picked because she's this cool looking exotic embodiment of death and dismemberment. Um, but my larger point is that we would neither pick Callie nor the Virgin Mary, um, nor should we because, you know, we should have some sort of respect for the belief systems of other people. Unless you're trying to make some grand statement on commentary on what the nature of those characters are and those respective religions, but I don't think that's what Smite's doing. So why is it offensive to borrow from unfamiliar cultures without firsthand experience or cooperation between artists and people? Well, as Ilya Morometz points out, it's not just rude or lazy or winds up making fun of uh, people's cultural traits. The big problem with a generic character like T-Hawk is that it erases culture and replaces it with this ersatz idea instead, where Native Americans are all all of these people who all wear feathered headdresses and smoke peace pipes, when in fact there are 200 distinct tribes of Native Americans who are all culturally distinct and unique and have um, their own traditions. Um, on that note, we had mentioned Thunder as being a problematic character um, for precisely that reason. In fact, Thunder, uh, part of Thunder's lore is that uh, he's from the Nez Pierce tribe and that's part of the character's, uh, part of the character's story. So sorry about that mix up and uh, thanks to the commentaries that pointed that out. If you'd like to learn more about actual Native American heritage, our Andrian recommends that you check out Thomas King's The Inconvenient Indian, a curious account of Native people in North America. One of the big ideas in the book is that the cliched images of Native Americans never really existed, except in the North American and European imagination. Meanwhile, we don't even really recognize the real Native Americans because they're just ordinary people living in society. Anyway, we'll um, link to it in the description.